week on Vaticano, Pope Francis meets with the newly appointed bishops from all over the world and reminds them of the essence of their mission. After 18 months of captivity, Father Tom Usanalil has been released and is now in Rome. Young people share their vocational journey in view of the upcoming Synod of Bishops. Stay with us to see how sport can unite different cultures and religions. For this and more, Vaticano starts now. On Sunday, September the 17th, before the Angelus Prayer, Pope Francis explained a passage from the Gospel of Matthew in which St. Peter asks Jesus how many times one must forgive. Since our baptism, God has forgiven us, remitting an insoluble debt, original sin. But that's the first time. Then, with unlimited mercy, he forgives us all the faults as soon as we show even a little sign of repentance. God is so merciful. The Holy Father said that it is important to forgive and ask for forgiveness. To forgive means to acknowledge that man, created in God's image, is greater than the evil that he commits. On Friday, September the 15th, Pope Francis met with the Italian National Association of Traveling Show People. The Holy Father told those assembled that their vocation is in the mission of offering people, both children and adults, opportunities for healthy and clean entertainment, and that within this vocation can clearly be seen the hand of God. I have to confess that I prefer your form of entertainment, which is so full of wonder and delight and which is also the fruit of hours and hours of hard work. A merry-go-round never ceases to amaze. It generates a sort of sweet joy in little ones and grown-ups as well. Pope Francis reminded these artists that they are artisans of festivities, wonder and beauty, called to nourish feelings of hope and trust. <laughs> On the morning of Thursday, September the 14th, Pope Francis received in private audience the newly appointed bishops from around the world. The Third Vatican Council. During the meeting, the Holy Father reminded the bishops of the nature of their mission. The mission that awaits you is not to bring your own ideas and projects, nor abstract, invented solutions that treat the church like your own vegetable garden, but, without seeking attention or any narcissistic behavior, to humbly offer your own concrete witness of union with God, serving the gospel that is cultivated and helped to grow in that specific situation. For a newly appointed Bishop Jorge Humberto Rodriguez Novello, it was the first time meeting the Pope. Uh, I felt uh, with the Pope like, a, like at home, like someone that I, I know, no? or I, I knew before, I was not. And then the fact that you are with so many bishops from all over the world uh, gives you the sense in the Clementine uh, no? uh, room that this is the church and we are with the Pope. So it's a very, very um, heartfelt and wonderful experience that I have, I enjoy this morning. The newly appointed bishops were in Rome to participate in the annual training program offered by the Vatican's Congregation for Bishops. You know, the main topic for this course was discernment. And we can say that the, uh, the life motif was we need to trust the Holy Spirit in the discernment, in moving on with the church, and to do it, and it was very emphasized, in a collegial way. We are all together as bishops, with the Pope, with our priest. So something that I really took to myself and I really, when I go back to my diocese, is to feel myself more committed to the Holy Father, more committed to my brother bishops that I enjoy their company in these days. And I hope I, I want to transmit to my brother priest the same feeling.
On Wednesday, September the 13th, Pope Francis had a very important and deeply moving meeting. Well, I have not personally come to the Holy Father, Pope Francis, uh, any time before. Pope is the vicar of Christ. I think in that meeting, Pope kissed my hand, I never deserve it. Father Tom Muzanalil was kidnapped on March the 4th, 2016, in the city of Aden in Yemen. Four unidentified gunmen broke into his church and killed 16 people, including four missionaries of charity, sisters of Mother Teresa. During his captivity, several photos and videos were posted, showing Father Tom pleading for help and for his release. On September the 12th, after 18 months of captivity, Father Tom was finally released. And the day after, he met with the Pope. That same week on Saturday, the Salesian community in Rome held a press conference on the liberation of Father Tom. I thank in the name of the Lord God, even my captors who have been understanding to me and have not heard, it's God's intervention. And that is due to the prayers and sacrifices of all my brothers and sisters, all of you, the whole world, my own country, other countries, Christians, Muslims, Hindus, all men of goodwill. I'm sure each one would have made the sacrifices. All that has got effect. And I, I am more convinced that if we do not keep selfish motives, keep selfish motives away and do the service. God will be with us and the best weapon against any enemy is love, prayer, forgiveness. Father Tom explained that his captors did not harm him in any way and even provided some basic medical care so he feels in good health of body and mind. He said that it might have been for the money, although the captors ultimately released him without any exchange of cash. Authorities from Oman and the Sultan himself worked to make his liberation possible. When the father tried to give a more detailed account of the death of the four sisters of charity, he was overcome with emotion and couldn't go on speaking. The missionaries of charity who are here, Maybe you can convey my thanks, and I'm sure they, the, the pain of their loss, but their loss is again for the whole world and for themselves. I'm sure these four who had gone are in heaven. Father Tom will now stay in Rome for some time in a Salesian community to recover his strength and then return to his native India. We all, you all rejoice, we all rejoice. Thank God for my freedom. May that happen. We continue. I am at the service of the Lord God. Let him continue to use me as he wants. Thanks for watching. Get ready to take a look at Holy See Diplomacy in action. Welcome back. You're watching Vaticano. Here at the UN Geneva on September 14th, the Holy See, the Order of Malta and the Caritas in Veritate Foundation organized this side event entitled The Human Rights to Safe Drinking Water and Sanitation. His Eminence Peter Cardinal Turkson was one of the keynote speakers. The human environment and the natural environment are inseparable and they are integrated. They develop or they, they, they deteriorate together. Therefore, if we want to adequately combat the human and social problems around access to water, we also need to address their ecological aspects. The event took place in conjunction with the 36th session of the UN Human Rights Council. Days earlier, in his statement before the UN, the Apostolic Nuncio reiterated steps taken by the governments to ensure 
access to safe, available, affordable, and acceptable drinking water must be deliberate, concrete, and targeted toward the full realization of the right to water for all. We had the opportunity to speak with the Cardinal during his visit to the Holy See Mission Geneva. The World Bank and other banks playing a key role in the creation of access to water. They often team up even with private investors. Yeah. If access to water and consequently sanitation is a human right, mm. should it not be freely subsidized by the government of rich countries, for example, instead of becoming interest and profit driven business for banks certainly, and investors? Certainly. If, if World Bank and those groups come into, uh, come into the water supply chain, it should be a way of coming to enable a government fulfill its obligation towards its citizens. It should not be coming in to create companies that would make water a, commod a commodity. The International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes states that about 10% of the world's water is privatized, especially in areas with severe water access problems. You can almost think, you can almost say that air is privatized. It's almost unthinkable for anybody to think that you know, the air we breathe can be privatized. And that's what it is with water. That's what it is with water. Water cannot be private. It's as much part of the natural environment, the natural habitat of the human family, that to privatize this is, if you want. It's all, it's all, if you want, I may use the word even criminal, OK? According to the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs, the right to water and sanitation is also a gender issue. Quote, gender does not simply refer to women and men but to the way their qualities, behaviors, and identities are determined through the process of socialization. There have been voices and currents in some of these UN quarters which have argued that we men and women not because of the way we're born, but it's because of how in our society, the role society ascribe and prescribe for us to follow. That is the part that, is the part that I think you know, we have difficulty with. We think that the, thing, the question about gender Thus, is basically rooted in the makeup of our bodies. The World Health Organization predicts that by 2025, half of the world's population will be living in water-stressed areas. So how is the Vatican's dicastery for promoting integral human development contributing to solutions? So, what have we done lately? Lately, because there have been some other initiatives in the past. Lately, uh, we took Lada to see and we created a Lada to see challenge, okay? And the Lada to see challenge uh, was, a, was, was an initiative that invited young entrepreneurs to take Lada to see and to look at these challenges and to propose solutions. Okay, the last time there were some who came who have designed filters, water filters, that you can hook onto any type of water despite the source and then drink a water, a water filter clean and uh, also disinfected. Indeed, they came with a bucket full of dirty water. Okay, put it on. He drank it and I drank some of it and I'm still here. So I must be alive so <laughs> still to be here. Second thing concretely is like the case of Sudan, for example, is to, is to work out a system that can have the extra water that comes to inundate, to flood the areas, to get to the other dry areas. It's going to call for a little bit of technology as well as purification and disinfectation of water. In Laudato Z, Pope Francis called it integral ecology, the integration of humans and nature, society and ecosystems. He wrote that to denying access to water is to denying the right to life. From the 11th to the 15th of September, the Vatican Department, called the Synod of Bishops, held here in Rome an international seminar on the theme, Youth, Faith, and Vocational Discernment. The seminar was a step toward the 2018 Assembly of the Synod of Bishops, summoned by Pope Francis. The Synod of Bishops is a permanent institution of the Catholic Church established in 1965. It's an assembly of bishops from around the world who assist the Pope on the important questions that the Church is facing. 
His Excellency, Bishop Fabio Fabene, is the Undersecretary of the Vatican Synod Office. He says that the purpose of this seminar is to help the Synodal Fathers reflect on the issues that young people are experiencing in our modern society. The Church is the mother, so she needs all her children, and in particular those who are young, because they are the present moment of the Church, and the present moment of our society, and the world. And they are also the future, our future, our hope, of the Church and of the world as well. Participants in the seminar gathered in Rome from different parts of the world. They had the chance to listen to testimonies of young people and to share the experience of young ministry in their own parishes. Ashley Green is from the Australian Diocese of Broken Bay. She shared the conclusions of a survey that the National Church carried out in order to identify the needs of young people in the country. Um, and interestingly, um, when young people were able to rate the church's ability to listen to young people, the church was, was rated as a 6 out of 10. So there's so much um, potential to improve in the way that the church listens to young people. And this seminar is a really great opportunity to provide that. The concept of vocation is very broad, and for the General Assembly of the Synod of Bishops, it mostly means the journey of young people towards states of life such as marriage, ordained ministry, consecrated life, and the single life. Finding vocation is something that's important to everyone. Um, I don't think it's possible to live um, a full and meaningful life without um, spending time discerning and spending time searching for that vocation because at the end of the day, everyone has a purpose and everyone has something to contribute and God has a plan for everyone. So it's up to all of us to search for what it is that God's calling us to in our life. For Father Ted Trinko, who was ordained a priest just a few months ago, the vocational journey started when he was 16 years old. Perhaps the most important part of that period of discernment, for me at least, was the taking of the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola. I mean, it was something which perhaps isn't so well known all around, but St. Ignatius wrote those spiritual exercises to help us find God's will for us in our lives. And that is exactly what happened. I took them twice, once when I was 16 and once when I was 18 years old. And it was through those spiritual exercises that I began to see with great clarity, this is what God wants. And this is what God wants now. I'm currently single, but I feel like my vocation is to marriage. And I think that um, what really helped me discern was um, having lots of mentors. And I've been really blessed in my life to have lots of mentors who've helped me along the way to discern my vocation. For me, the ordination was something that was even more special on a, on a supernatural level because of the reality of what was taking place in that ordination, in the, in the rite of the consecration, the anointing of hands, where the priest, where I became capable from that moment on of transforming a piece of bread into the body of Christ. Like that was something that for me at least was the most, the most stupendous part of the ordination. And that was an incredible blessing to be able to live that moment and then every single day since then to be able to look at my hands and to be able to see that these are the hands that can bring God from heaven down to earth. Both Father Ted Trinko and Ashley Green say that the community within the parish and personal prayer are crucial in the discernment of one's own vocation. If we manage to give this testimony of happiness, of joy, and of life lived to the fullest, I believe we will also manage to walk with our youth and proclaim Jesus as well. Because vocation means calling, it's not merely a personal desire. It's something which comes from above. It's the voice of God. In a few moments, we'll be back with more on Vaticano. More on Vaticano begins now. On the morning of Sunday, September the 17th, Rome was filled with people in green t-shirts running through its streets. Athletes of all ages, religions, and nationalities were running with the same aim. The Rome Half Marathon, Via Pacis, is the initiative that stands for peace and dialogue among the different peoples and religions. The run was promoted jointly by the Pontifical Council for Culture and the City of Rome, 
and organized by the Italian Federation of Light Athletics. During the press conference organized a few days before the race, Monsignor Melchor Sanchez, Undersecretary of the Pontifical Council for Culture, said that the Vatican started supporting the idea soon after it learned about it. Via Pacis is an initiative that has roots deep. This event, the Via Pacis, has quite a long history. We started to discuss the project more than two years ago at a meeting with the Council for Sports of the City of Rome. There, the idea of organizing a sport event was brought up, and after the possibility of soccer was ruled out, a popular race was suggested, as there are many others nowadays. A particular popular race, though, because it took its inspiration from the pilgrimage of the seven churches, sanctuaries of the Christian religion, which was practiced here in Rome. A race, then, which passes by the most important places of worship of Rome, a modern city with a diverse soul and where many religious communities coexist. Monsignor Melchor added that he himself would join the race together with a group of Vatican athletes. On Sunday, September 17th, the Vatican Athletic Society will be officially presented. It's the group of runners who work in the Vatican. There's lay people and priests, men and women, from the pharmacist to the core of the Vatican, for the unity of all Christians. People from the Vatican Library, the Swiss Guards, the Vatican Gendarmerie Police. All the Vatican family will show up at the marathon. On Sunday, September the 17th, more than 5,000 athletes signed up for the race and were all ready to start. The ceremony opening the day was hosted by the mayor of Rome, Virginia Raggi, accompanied by representatives of different religious groups of the city. A very important event, which we organized together with the Vatican and other religious groups and communities. And today's the first edition. And uh, we are here to, to share this uh, opportunity to, uh, to promote peace uh, and uh, the effort, uh, the own effort towards uh, the, the human aim, uh, that is uh, community fraternity, but also the, the freedom. Islamic community participates uh, all, uh, today uh, in this um, in initiative uh, uh, for um, for giving, um, uh, for giving and uh, uh, assecurate the values of, of peace. The Vatican is running because St. Paul reminds us in the letter to the Philippians, I'm running towards Christ. My finish line, the Christian life, is a race towards Christ. And at 9 a.m. sharp Rome time, the race started. The route prepared by the organizers emphasized the diversity of the city of Rome. It went through the Vatican, passed by the Roman synagogue, and Muslim mosque, the Valdez and Orthodox churches, and then wound its way back past St. Peter's Square. The main message the event wanted to promote was brotherhood and the peaceful coexistence between different peoples and religions. But each runner took part with their own special messages. I decided to participate because the message of peace and unity and collaboration is something that really resonates with me. For fun, for a nice view of Rome and for the peace. We ran just to join to this group uh, to testify that uh, to create the peace uh, we need to work, we need all to do something to do our effort and so we need to be together. I love to run, I love the life. Because I like it, it, it feels me free. About one hour after the start, the Italian athlete, Ayob Faniel, crossed the line at one hour, three minutes and 26 seconds and became the winner of the Rome Half Marathon in the men's section. With the time of one hour, 15 minutes and 37 seconds, tired but with a big smile, the Italian athlete, Sara Brogiato, won the race in the women's section. Tiring, yes, but not too much. I had so much fun, such an emotional race. I didn't really expect to win. What a great result, and unexpected. After the awards ceremony, the participants went to St. Peter's Square, where Pope Francis welcomed them after the Angelus prayer. 
Saluto i partecipanti alla corsa podistica Via Pacis. I greet participants in the Via Pacis athletic race. Che ha toccato luoghi di culto delle diverse confessioni Which passed places of worship of the different religious faiths present in Rome. I hope that this cultural and athletic event fosters dialogue, coexistence and peace. La convivenza e la pace. And so ended the first edition of the Rome Marathon for Peace, but the organizers want this event to become an annual tradition. Join us next week for Vaticano. Hear the testimony of Sister Silvia, one of the survivors of the invasion of northern Iraq by ISIS forces. Thanks for watching.